I'm pumped to be able to introduce to you uh, two amazing people. We've got Eric Capuano, who I've had the good fortune of traveling all kinds of crazy places with and teaching and adventuring uh, in, uh, in uh, around the world in Europe and such. Uh, and we also have Whitney Champion, who I have followed Whitney's work for a long, long time and just thoroughly impressed to have uh, both of you here and able to share this with us. Um, they're both at uh, Recon InfoSec. Uh, they are also behind the wildly popular OpenSock competition that I know a number of you have probably heard of. And if you haven't, you should go check it out because they've done a great job with it. Um, but just in general, uh, always interesting to hear their perspective on, on breaches in general and a lot of what we're seeing adversaries adapt to and how they're they're migrating to uh, to new technologies and what we can do to try and detect them before or after the fa their, uh, the fact. But um, I will turn it over to you because I know you are busting at the seams with content and I don't want to steal any of your minutes away. Uh, so thanks so much for, for coming to us. And uh, uh, I don't know if there's going to be any Airstream references in here, but I'm kind of hoping so, Eric. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm counting on you. Excellent. Okay. Again, thanks a lot for that introduction, Phil. Um, so uh, I really appreciate everybody showing up today to hear our talk uh, called Breaches Be Crazy. I want to first and foremost uh, throw full credit to my colleague, uh, Whitney, for coming up with that super awesome to uh, talk title. Um, and that's exactly what we're uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, kind of as Phil mentioned, right? You know the you know the the threat landscape, the the adversary TTPs, all these things are constantly evolving because attackers are of course going to innovate to continue to be effective at what it is they're seeking to do. So if we as responders, as defenders, aren't constantly innovating, then naturally we lag behind. And so that's a little bit about what this talk is uh, is about: is how we have innovated using some of the best in breed open source tools. You're gonna to see a heavy emphasis on open source in this talk, how we've gathered these, these uh, components and taught them to work together very seamlessly so that we can move with agility, with speed in the face of massive breaches, right? Um, because my team's relatively small and uh, we need to be able to keep up with you know, breaches that are, that are you know, tens if not hundreds of systems. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we've accomplished that. So before we get into that, I'll go ahead and uh, go through a uh, couple introductions here real quick. So myself, my name is Eric Capuano. Uh, I am one of the co-founders and the CTO of Recon InfoSec. Um, I'm also a SANS DFIR instructor. So uh, I may have had some of you in class for Forensics 508 um, and hopefully some of you in the future. Um, I'm also formerly with the United States Air Force, which is effectively where I started my career in uh, cybersecurity um, and with the Air National Guard, Texas Department of Public Safety and some other um, uh, positions before I eventually came to find uh, to, to create recon. Um, and then there, there you can see my Twitter handle down below as well. Uh, Whitney, you want to tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, um, thanks. I'm Whitney Champion. Uh, I work with Eric over at Recon InfoSec, uh, co-founder and lead architect over there. Um, my background is heavily uh, revolved around security um, and cloud infrastructure. So that's, that's the bulk of my role here at Recon. Um, Prior to that, I was Booz Allen, Red Hat, Spay War. Um, I'm pretty heavily involved in the open source community and um, and the DEF CON community too. So if you've heard of DEF CON, um, the Hacker Tracker app, that was, that was my my brainchild many, many years ago. Um, but yeah. Awesome. So that's a bit about us. I would also love to tell you a little bit about Recon as a whole, uh, kind of what we do. Um, primarily, we are a managed detection response, or some of you might know it as SOC as a service. Um, so that's pretty self-explanatory. We are the SOC for many um, organizations across the uh, across the world, across all industries. We are obviously uh, also incident response practitioners. Uh, matter of fact, we have three um, uh, happening right now. <laughs> so uh, leading up to the talk and then right after the talk, we're going to be doing uh, IR. Um, and then also we do provide training as well. So we operate a, uh, what we call our network defense range, which is a live fire simulated environment. We're able to unleash really well-crafted adversary emulation scenarios uh, for training blue teams on how to detect and respond to those types of uh, threats. And then also, as Phil mentioned, um, we run a really fun uh, CTF at DEF CON um, and some uh, B-Sides events um, all, you know, around the year called OpenSOC. Um, and if you've not heard of it, definitely something to check out. You can go to opensoc.io. It's something we do for free at these events, and it's a ton of fun. It's a great way to kind of get your, get your, uh, your feet wet in, in that space. And then 
Uh, Whitney, uh, this is your reference here. Uh, our, our, our final bullet, reti retired to the nerdery with uh, our calculators. <laughs> that, was, that was some pop culture that was lost on me at, at first, but uh, yeah, good times. We have a good sense of humor on our team. So hopefully that's all right with you all. Okay, so talking a little bit about the problem, right? There, there's always a problem statement, something that we had to seek a solution for. So most of you are gonna be familiar with this problem, right? IR is terribly clunky. It is very hard to scale because a lot of the, the well-known tools and techniques that we have are time consuming. For instance, how do you first know which systems need to be investigated, right? Like there's the, the age old issue of how do you scope the intrusion, right? And that, that depends. If you're, if you're a consultant like I am, it's like the worst case scenario, you drop into these environments, there's no seam, there's no log aggregation. So if you're lucky, they've got maybe a really good EDR tool that's got some decent actionable alerts that you can start from. But beyond that, you're going, you're going old school forensics because there's no data lake for you to go and start hunting it. Um, and so even simply identifying you know, which systems are involved can be a very difficult thing, very time consuming. Okay, but let's say we get past that part. Now, what do we do? Uh, well, traditional forensics might tell you, let's go put hands on systems. Let's go take disk images. Let's go dump memory images. Okay, um, I hope you got some time, right? Because you know, if you've got 10, 15, 50 systems involved, I hope you got a lot of spare hard drives because like you're, you're gonna be here for a long time doing that. And chances are, by the time you're done gathering all this evidence, I mean, the, the, the ransomware has been carried out, you know, the, 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 the the intellectual property has been stolen and you've missed the bus, right? Uh, and then next is kind of still, even with all of our innovations, still a bit of a time consuming process, but it's, it's how do we take all that raw forensic data and then process it so that we have something that our analysts can very easily start to put together a timeline of what took place, right? That's, that's one of those time consuming pieces that you can improve, but you can't eliminate because you know, we, you know, computers only compute so fast, right? But I am going to show you how we have streamlined that, that step as well. And then lastly, the thing that they pay us to do, right? As, as, you know, analysts, you know, we're being paid for our gray matter to look at the data and make heads or tails, right? Because anybody can look at, you know, a system and try to make a determination. It takes skills and it takes expertise in order to determine what these different artifacts are telling us in the context of one another, in the context of the bigger picture, and so on. All right, well, traditionally, this, as you can see, this, this process does not scale. It does not scale beyond one or two or three systems, right? Um, you get beyond one or two systems, you gotta put behind you the, 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 the need to get forensic disk images or the need to dump full memory dumps. Now, of course, your mileage may vary depending on use case. Let me be clear about that, right? If you're in law enforcement or you know, if, if you typically work cases that end up in a courtroom, then you already know what your requirements are. So I'm not talking to you. But for enterprise intrusions, right? For, for big, large scale intrusions where ransomware or you know, um, you know, uh, espionage and a lot of the things we're seeing these days, um, I'm sorry, but that's not gonna end up in a courtroom, right? You know, it's, it's more than likely going to be something that you're just gonna have to you know, get through, survive, you know, remediate, you know, restore integrity to the environment, and then you move on. Yeah, we can report it to the FBI, the, the, you know, the IC3, but let's be honest, our chain of custody is never gonna see the light of day. So let's. Let's work smarter, not harder, and let's learn to scale this process so that we can actually keep our head above water when we're dealing with massive scale intrusions. So um, a little bit about how we're doing it. This is kind of a, an oversimplification of it, right? Well, we, we have a tool that we're, we're very fond of called Velociraptor. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And then we have some magic, right? And then naturally we're, 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 we're moving the, we're moving the ball forward and, 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 and scalability. So let me show you that the, the real thing that that looks like. All right. So I'm kind of giving you the preview. Okay. Of what's to come. I want to show you, first of all, this is how we're doing it today. We can parachute into a client environment and I don't care if they've got 200 endpoints or 200,000 endpoints. We'll parachute in. One of the first things we're going to do is we're going to have the client deploy Velociraptor, which we're going to talk about in a minute. It's open source agent. It's fantastic. With Velociraptor, I can rapidly triage 100, 1,000, doesn't matter, as many systems as, as I need to. I can go ahead and perform triage acquisitions, right? Now, at the sake of not leaving too many folks behind, if, you, if you're not familiar with the concept, what we're talking about here is instead of taking 500 gig disk images or terabyte disk images, 
I'm just gonna go after the artifacts that are most meaningful to me as an investigator, right? Which will end up being some number of gigabytes, maybe not hundreds, definitely not terabytes. So scale that across hundreds of systems. Now we're dealing with a manageable data set. So Velociraptor is the facilitator for that. Well, what Whitney has built, and she's gonna talk about all the intricate pieces of it. What Whitney has built is a fully automated end-to-end -end pipeline, meaning I as the as, as the incident responder, all I have to do is choose which systems do I want to triage and process. I, I aim Velociraptor at them. I go get a cup of coffee, maybe go for a run. I come back and I'm ready to analyze data. I didn't have to think about all those steps in between, right? And we're going to talk about all those steps though. And then we're going to kind of tie it up with here's how we've automated it. And we're going to share all of that with you. So let me talk about the individual components here because you know a lot of these tools don't need an introduction because matter of fact, several of these tools have even uh, been featured in previous years deeper summits. But I do wanna make sure that no one's left in the dark on well, what's a Velociraptor, what's a time sketch. So I'm gonna touch on each of these tools um, at a high level. Um, so Velociraptor, which is one of the heavier lifters here is an open source DFIR focused agent, all right? Now, what I love about Velociraptor is it's server client style architecture, right? So it's not just an agent that you run on one system and it does some things. No, I can have a server and I can have 10,000 agents all reporting back to that server, giving me the ability as an instant responder to run hunts and do all kinds of activities across that entire fleet of systems. Um, it's open source, right? If I hadn't said that already, uh, cross platform. So all your major operating systems you're gonna be dealing with Windows, Mac, Linux, you can, you can uh, run hunts on these as well. And it's very extensible. And what I mean by that is out of the box, Velociraptor will already do almost anything you could imagine as an investigator. But if there's something novel or interesting you'd like to do with it that it can't do already, no problem. It's a simple query language that you can reuse to pull down any arbitrary executable that you need. So maybe you got a, 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 an EDR you wanna install. Maybe you wanna deploy Sysmon, which by the way, we use it to deploy Sysmon. Um, any number of things you can imagine, Velociraptor can almost be like an orchestration tool for you to allow you to deploy any other agents that you need to facilitate your investigation. And we do that quite a bit. So uh, there's so many things I can tell you right now, this could have easily been a 30 minute talk on Velociraptor. That's obviously not what it is. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna talk about the way we're using Velociraptor to perform triage acquisitions, but I do encourage you to go and read more about Velociraptor because it, 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 we're barely gonna do it justice today on how powerful it is. Matter of fact, as I mentioned, we're in the middle of, of three IRs right now. And so just last night, I'm using Velociraptor to run Yara scans against process memory of 250 systems in a matter of minutes. You know, I mean, it is incredibly powerful for the price of free 99, right? Uh, huge fan of uh, Velociraptor. So how are we using Velociraptor though, in order to rapidly triage any number of systems in the, in the midst of an intrusion? So this is generally what it would look like in the UI for Velociraptor. So for instance, let's say uh, these three systems here are the ones that I have identified as likely compromised. These are the ones that I wanna dig deeper into. I wanna take a forensic approach to analyzing these. So I could just simply select those three systems as I've done here. But let me be clear, there's, I could, this could easily be a hundred systems, but for, the, for uh, demonstration purposes, we've got these three here. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slap a label on those three systems and it's whatever I wanna choose. You know? So I'll choose the word compromised. I'm gonna say these three systems are compromised. That label becomes useful for me later on when I run follow on hunts, I can target all systems that have the compromised label. And that's what we're gonna do. So here we are now kicking off a hunt in Velociraptor. So I'm just giving it a description, you know, triage our compromised systems, and I'm aiming it at the systems that include the label compromised. Pretty straightforward, right? Now, as I define the hunt, this is where I need to inform it that I want to use the CAPE files artifact. Now, yes, I'm mentioning another tool here, by the way. CAPE, for those of you that are familiar, CAPE is another fantastic triage acquisition tool. Big fan, it can do a lot of the same things that I'm showing you that uh, Velociraptor can do. Um, but for all intents and purposes, one of the things I love about Velociraptor is it can leverage the same files that CAPE uses as a repository for where is the forensics evidence. So that's effectively what that is. And there's a link down below you can go and take a look at. It's an open source uh, collection of target files of all the collective DFER knowledge about where the best forensic artifacts live. 
So all I'm effectively doing is telling Velociraptor, hey, we're gonna do a Kate Files acquisition. So now I'm gonna customize my Cape acquisition. So I'm gonna tell Velociraptor what I want, what I don't want, and so on and so forth. So one of the first things I like to highlight here is that we have volume shadow support. So for those of you that are familiar with that, it's like a time machine, right? Not only is it gonna get the artifacts on the system today, it's gonna go back in time into however many volume shadow snapshots exist on the system, and it's gonna get those artifacts too. So you might surprise yourself with three years worth of event logs. I'm not kidding, it's happened to me, right? Like, you're like, whoa, hold on a minute. Like, where did that come from? Volume shadow, it is, it is magical. So you could include or choose not to include volume shadow. That's totally up to you and you know what the time frame is, is of your, uh, your intrusion. Couple of other uh, things that we can choose here is, Specifically, which targets do I want to go after? One of my favorite ones, and you know, of course, uh, got to shine some light on, on SANS here, is called the SANS triage uh, target list because it's a really, really well curated um, list of all the best artifacts. Now, your mileage may vary. You might need more specific or, or less specific. You might, you know, you might only want to go after EVTX files. You might want to only go after prefetch files, whatever, and you can do that. But if you kind of just want all the goods, you know, kind of the kitchen sink approach, SANS triage is a really solid place to start because it's going to get just about everything you can think of and even things you probably didn't think of. Now, scrolling down, all of this is still in the same little window there. Scrolling down, one of the other options I personally prefer to enable is the don't be lazy here. This is simply telling Velociraptor to use the raw NTFX, NTFS accessor because I don't want it to miss anything. Because yes, in my experience, it, it, it has missed things when that box is not checked. So uh, a little bit of tribal knowledge there that I'm passing on to you all here. Okay, so once I kick off this hunt, oh, one more very important detail. When we're telling Velociraptor to carry out a hunt across 10, 100,000 systems, it's also gonna allow us to specify um, minimum and maximum thresholds effectively for how much resources should it consume on the endpoints or how long should it be allowed to run. Usually the defaults are fine. You almost never need to mess with the defaults. In a triage acquisition though, this is a time consuming thing because it's not only gonna gather up a couple terabytes of, I'm sorry, couple gigabytes of files on that endpoint, but now it needs to upload them to the Velociraptor server. So you wanna be sure to give it ample time. So as sort of a shortcut, we just throw five nines in there, or what is that, six nines? Yeah, an arbitrary number that says, please don't time out this hunt. I want it to run to completion so I can get all those files off that endpoint and up to my Velociraptor server. All right, it'll give us one final opportunity to review the raw uh, JSON of that uh, request that's about to get dispatched out to those endpoints. And then finally, we tell it we want to launch the hunt. Once we launch the hunt, it has already identified that there are three systems affected by this hunt because of the presence of the compromised label. And I could sit here and wait until the number of finished clients matches that number. So it's saying three are scheduled and now three are finished. So the job is done. So at this point, I could go ahead and just simply download all of that triage acquisition goodness right here from the Velociraptor GUI. But I'm gonna tell you here in a minute, you don't even need to do that. But I can, if I need to, I can pull it down here manually, but we've got, we've got a, better, uh, a better approach that we're gonna share with you. Okay, so that's Velociraptor. So another piece of this puzzle I need to share with you is a tool or a suite of tools um, known as Plazo. Now, um, some of you, especially if you've taken uh, any of our forensics courses, you're probably pretty familiar with Plazo. For those of you that are not, just think of it as this. It is a powerhouse of forensics and uh, processing capability. It is capable of analyzing so many different forensic artifacts out of the box. It is a very, very, very powerful tool, also open source. Uh, maintained by the awesome folks over at Google. Um, matter of fact, uh, Rob Lee loves to tell the story. The, the Plazo came to be because of a previous uh, Forensics 508 student who decided to go out and solve a very major problem of not having a universal uh, artifact parser. And that's essentially how uh, Plazo or its one of its components, log to timeline, came to be. But the main thing I want you to know about Plazo is it is capable of taking any number of raw artifacts you can imagine. If it's something that's important to you, Plazo probably knows how to parse it. And that's everything from your, your prefetch, your shim cache, your registry hives, your event logs, your link files. Uh, I mean, the list goes on, right? All of that stuff, you simply feed that into Plazo 
and it's going to spit out essentially a universal, unified, chronologically ordered timeline of every single thing that's happened on that system since it was first provisioned. Um, it is a very mind-blowing and eye-opening capability. Uh, also, again, as I mentioned, free. It's kind of crazy to me sometimes to see the capabilities of these free tools. Okay, and the last tool I want to show you that's part of this magic is Time Sketch. So Time Sketch is the, just think of it as the front end for being able to interact with that timeline that was produced by Plazo. Now, what I love about Time Sketch is it's backed by Elasticsearch, so it's very scalable. It can handle millions upon millions and millions of events. So you could have 100, 100 timelines in there, and depending on obviously backend system resources, it can handle that. But what else I love about it is that it is collaborative. So if you have three, four, five analysts on your team, they can all be analyzing the same timelines and annotating and making comments against the things that they're seeing, right? So if you're coming from the old days of looking at timelines in Excel or you know some other tools, okay, great. But if you ever wanted to share that timeline with a colleague and, and look at it together and make notes on it together, time sketch is where you want to be. So just a couple of, uh, of um, screenshots of time sketch. Those of you that are familiar with Elasticsearch, Kibana, it's a similar look and feel, some slight differences. Like for instance, you see here where I can star an item, something that's significant to me, uh, but I can also expand an item and type comments against it, which is phenomenal. I can include or exclude specific timelines at will. Um, it is just incredibly powerful tool. But again, moving on because I can't necessarily give all these tools the, the real uh, you know, deep dive that I would love to, but I'm giving you the resources down below to go read more about these individual tools themselves. What I really wanna share with you all today is actually Whitney's magic on how did we take these individual tools, tie them all together to make them work seamlessly from start to finish so that your analysts can just simply dispatch that, that agent, say, give me the data, come back in a couple hours max, and have you know 10 or 20 or 50 timelines ready to analyze. So that takes us to Whitney. Whitney, go ahead and uh, uh, kick off your, your magic and I'll, I'll move the slides for you. Yay, okay, um, go ahead. All right, so basically um, Eric set that up and mentioned that once you go ahead and triage all the systems, sure, you've got the ability to go and download all those zips, but nobody wants to do that. So what we've done is built a pipeline that essentially takes all those zips and fast tracks them to time sketch so that you don't have to touch a thing and they're all sitting there waiting in one or more sketches for you to, to work through and triage. So essentially I've broken up uh, that into four different components. So the first one is the Velociraptor artifact. Go ahead. <clears throat> so this is a snippet of the Velociraptor artifact. It's not the entire thing, but this is um, this runs as a server artifact on Velociraptor. If you're familiar with the the terminology within Velociraptor, um, what it does is it it watches that Cape triage artifact that you've run against X Y Z systems, and once those are done. It will say, hey, I'm done. Here's this zip file. What do you want me to do with it? And so it takes that and depending on what kind of endpoint you aim it at, in our case, we gave it an S3 bucket. We give it the credentials um, for the S3 bucket with the, the client ID or the, excuse me, um, the, the key and the, um, the bucket name, et cetera. And it'll plop that zip right in S3 for us. So that is step one. I got jokes. <laughs> so all of this is going to be in a GitHub repo. We have the URL at the end of the slides. Um, but yeah, I don't expect anybody to remember all that. But um, the, this will be one single artifact from Velociraptor. Um, essentially, this artifact is just a YAML file that sits in Velociraptor running as a server side artifact. Uh, as always watching for that Cape triage artifact to finish um, and then bundle it all up nicely, ship it off to S3, and that's where we'll go from there. So this part uh, is essentially what's going to take that zip file and get it to time sketch. So what we've done is we've got a service that is sitting on, uh, in this case, a Ubuntu system that's running time sketch. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the time sketch server. Um, it can be, um, makes it easier. It's one less hop, 
but um, there's a service that we've got. It's running just a simple Python script that is sitting here. Use if you're familiar with uh, the AWS API, this is using Boto, Boto three, and it's pulling that S3 bucket every however many minutes you've configured it to pull. It's totally uh, up to you. But I think in our case, we said, hey, every ten minutes, check check this bucket for new zip files that are named whatever we decide to name them. It's a private S3 bucket. So again, we give it credentials. Um, we provide it credentials via Boto. It grabs that zip and saves it, or um, time sketch, the time sketch, blah, excuse me, the time sketch instance will have downloaded it to whatever directory we tell it to download it to. So now we've got the zip sitting on the time sketch server. Well, now we got to get the data into time sketch. Um, Again, the parameters here are entirely configurable. The default um, place that I decided to deploy time sketch in this case was opt slash time sketch. So there's a default upload directory if you do the Docker deployment. So stick the zip file in that upload directory after that previous step has gone through and downloaded the zip file. So once we've got that zip file, it says it's watching that directory for new zips. So if you're familiar with the, the binary I notify on a Linux system, we've got a service that is sitting here pulling that, that directory essentially saying, hey, notify me when a new file has been put in this directory. Um, if it sees a new zip file, it will begin essentially processing um, log to timeline. So as Eric mentioned, uh, Plazo earlier, this will spit out a single Plazo file from each of those um, triage zips that we that we um, brought from Velociraptor. So each system has a system name.zip and it'll spit out a system name.plazo after log to timeline does its processing. Um, once we've got a Plazo file, that needs to get into time sketch. So uh, if you've used multiple versions of time sketch, this is um, the new way. Previously, I think um, we had to do p sort to get it to pump into the Elastic backend. Well, now we've got this nice fancy time sketch importer uh, that will take all of those Plazo files and just pump them into new sketches. So it, it kind of eliminates an extra step in this case. We can tell it exactly which uh, sketch we want it to go to. It'll take all those brand new shiny timelines and put them into XYZ sketches that we want them to sit in. Um, so these are actually two separate services that are going to be running, sitting here watching for iNotify to put that zip file in there. Um, and then there was another thing that we actually found this week, like Eric mentioned, we're running multiple IRs right now, and we've got a lot of things going on. Well, this process is in heavy use at the moment. So <laughs> um, unbeknownst to me, we ran out of iNotify user watches. So if, if you're familiar with uh, I notify or any kind of limitations on a Linux box. There's there's always some kind of hard coded limit in sysctl.conf. Well, we hit that limit, and I think the default is like eight thousand one hundred and ninety something. So um, I noted in the repo that you'll probably have to go change that if you're doing a ton and ton and ton of data. Um, you will have to up that I notify limit so that service doesn't bomb or add some other sort of check in there. But we found that out the hard way this week, and so. Now you don't have to, hooray. Next. Um, so now this was kind of, this is, I mean, all this is essentially optional, but this was especially optional. We wanted to make sure that we saved those Plaza files after all that processing, because otherwise we would have to start over from a zip. And for our arch archival purposes, um, we wanted to keep those in a safe place. So once those Plaza files are done being generated, um, there is another service sitting there watching for new Plaza files to be created. And once again, calling out to the, to the S3 uh, API to drop those back in a bucket so we can keep those um, for X amount of time if we need to go reference them again. Go ahead. So uh, once, once we've run all this, this is essentially what it's gonna look like when it's done. The newest version of Time Sketch is super awesome in that, I wish I could have made a GIF out of this, I should have, but um, it's awesome because if you see down in that left hand, bottom left hand where it says timelines, 
when that time sketch importer of binary is actually running, this will show as in process. So you can real time watch all the data coming in, whereas before it was kind of a, a black box. You weren't sure where it was unless you were sitting there watching the command line. But this is really cool because now the analyst can see how the progress is going. Um, you can see where it's at. Um, so that's a that's a really nice to have. And so now all the good stuff is bundled up in here. Um, there is an install script in here also, um, but it's, we we only recently made this public, so feel free to contribute back. Another thing I would like to add in here at some point um, is probably some well Slack messages or some kind of some kind of notification that says where it is in the pipeline because right now, without knowing, you just kind of know that it's somewhere between S3 and time sketch and that it'll get there eventually once you see it and on the time sketch UI processing. But it would be nice to have like a step by step along the way uh, notification. But there it is. And so one super cool thing I forgot to mention about Plaza um, is that it is a multi threaded processor. So oh. why? Yeah, the reason we we leverage cloud resources for this is that um, you know, you might have some forensics processing workstation in your office that's got 16 cores and that's great. Um, I can spin up an EC2 instance with 64 cores and then just spin it down when I'm done with it in order to, you know, churn through, you know, a hundred systems worth of evidence um, in a matter of hours instead of days and days and days. So that's another reason why we're huge fans of leveraging uh, the, you know, EC2 in, a, you know, AWS resources. Um, to just quickly power through all that data and then provide time sketch instance uh, that's securely hosted behind an identity aware proxy and all that kind of good stuff so that my analyst can reach it from anywhere but behind our, our um, super secure authentication mechanisms. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think that uh, wraps it up for us. So um, obviously we're happy to field any questions um, you know, here or in the hallway and uh, I guess uh, check out our website, uh, Recon InfoSec, obviously the company. Um, um, we have a blog, and then of course, OpenSock has its uh, page as well. And that's all we have. Thanks a lot for, for having us, folks. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you very much, both of you, for sharing that. There's, uh, you know, certainly no, our environments are not getting smaller after all. Um, you know, you certainly brought up some interesting approaches for this. And one of the cool comments that uh, I saw in the, the chat as well that probably doesn't directly fit in with the scalability that you were talking about, but I think speaks really nicely to the versatility of Velociraptor is, you know, you talk about this being connected and using the network to farm out the uh, the collections. It's also a tool that you can use to build a collection package to take to an offline system. Um, in doing that, I'm wondering if you have anything that you could speak to just briefly about the possibility of incorporating disparate offline systems if you did have an air gapped or an otherwise disconnected network um, that would kind of give you the benefits of scalability that you discussed without needing the connectivity on the first the first stage of that. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, Velociraptor can work as a standalone offline agent. It doesn't require connectivity to a Velociraptor server. And so you can absolutely, and by the way, uh, we do, um, we prepackage our MSI, our Velociraptor MSI, and you can too, to have whatever basic configuration you want it to have. And so you can pre-configure it to be a standalone agent that goes ahead and, and runs the triage, but it, that stores the files locally or shoots them over to a network share or whatever your needs are. And then the way you kind of bridge the gap, still be able to scale the processing of it because the collection of it's still gonna be fast. The only, the only downside is you're gonna end up having to sneaker net those acquisitions to a system that can reach the internet. But then you, the rest of the process is ba basically the same. What I would do, what I would do is, I would run, you know, however many offline acquisitions I need to stage all of those on a system with internet access. And then we mm. can, you know, throw those right into the same S3 bucket and then let that, uh, let that job just take it from there because it's going to see the zips once they arrive and it's going to, it's just going to grab them up like an assembly line and, and pump them all in, whether it's 10 or a hundred. Perfect. Yeah, that that's, that's just it. I love how it's just so completely versatile in the mo model that you use for that. Um, question from uh, Korstian, are you running that server in the client environment or is that uh, the Velociraptor server that is, uh, is that something that you're running in your own part of the environment and then bringing in the client data from there? 
it's in our environment. And so those agents will ship that data back up to our Velociraptor. Got it. And I could imagine that, you know, if you did need to pick that whole concept up and put it into a client's private environment, that the model would stay pretty much the same. Matter of fact, let me just say how incredibly easy it would be to do that. That's also one of the reasons we love Velociraptor is that the deployment of the server is so easy, you'll think you did it wrong because it is literally the same executable that you would run on a, on a client. You would run on the server. The only difference is the configuration file. So I could walk into a customer environment with a thumb drive with a single executable on it and then have a Velociraptor server and a thousand clients up in a matter of minutes uh, because it's just that easy. It's not some big convoluted apt get installed, run a bunch of scripts. No, it's run this executable. Um, and so, yes, if we had to go into a customer environment that say was fully air gapped and closed off, I could have a Velociraptor server in that environment in minutes with one executable and then use the same executable to deploy it all the agents and be done with it. So yeah, hundred percent. Fantastic. Well, I think I heard both of your doorbells just ring that thank you gift basket from, uh, from Mike Cohen, <laughs> Velociraptor. But in all seriousness, no, it, it's it's fantastic, and and you've really shown a a, fan, a, a great use case for a, a public open source tool, and really shown that in a way that uh, I think a lot of folks are pretty pretty excited about based on the chat. So 